Amen. I want you to remain standing, if you would, take your Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And last week we began to look at this subject of marriage, divorce, remarriage, and uh, we, we admitted that it is, uh, it's an area today that it, that's probably affected everybody in this room. Um, I told you that my grandmother, who was born in 1902, uh, her marriage, her first marriage did not work out. She had two children, and uh, it ended up in divorce. And believe you me, back about the 1920s when that happened, society, culture pretty much ostracized, alienated you. She went through a very, very difficult time. And uh, to today, I would say, probably one of the most influential figures in my life was my grandmother. I, I told you last week that my mom also was... Uh, uh, married to a man and it didn't work out. I think he was running around on her. She was left in New York uh, with a little girl and uh, struggling. She lived in an apartment upstairs. She worked in a, in a place, just a little restaurant there as a waitress trying to make ends meet. It was a very, very hard time for her. Eventually she met my dad, married him, had three more kids and, and, and she's now in heaven with my grandmother. Both my sisters are precious people that I love dearly. Both of them were in marriages that did not work out uh, due to situations and circumstances that uh, were beyond anything they could do anything about. If we were honest, we know that divorce affects probably every one of us at some time in some family form or fashion, and we know the cost of that. Let me say today, I'm... I'm here to encourage you, if you're married, to stay married. Um, I, I think about, I love a story an evangelist told one time. He was a, an evangelist. He spent a lot of time on the road, and he said that uh, one night he came in, it had been a long week, a full week revival, been on the road, got in about 1 o'clock in the morning. He said he was, exa he was exhausted. He walked into the kitchen, fixed him a little bite to eat there at 1 o'clock in the morning to sit down a moment, and he said on the table, the dining room table, was this what looked like a toy, but it was just absolutely in pieces. And it was scattered out on the table, and in a scribbly little note, it said, Daddy, I knew you could fix this. And, and he, he said he looked at it and he thought, man, there is no way. Too late, he couldn't go buy another toy like it. He sat there looking, he began to uh, put all the pieces, separate them out and, and um, you know, trying to figure out the problem. He said for the next three and a half hours, he worked on that toy. He put it, he fixed it, he put it back together, he set it down in the middle of that table, and across that little scribbly child's note, he wrote fixed, F-I-X-E-D, and underlined it twice, and then went to bed. You know, a lot of times in relationships and marriage, the only one that can fix it is God. And, uh, you know, if I could say anything to people that may be watching live stream, you right now, you may be in a difficult situation right now and you're, you're saying, you know, I don't know what to do. First thing you need to do is turn it over to the Lord. Trust the Lord. Psalm 127 said, except the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain that build it. God wants marriages to work. In fact, Malachi 2, God said he hates divorce. And let me tell you, I hate it uh, because of the pain and the sorrow and the hurt that it brings into the life of so many people. And I've never met anybody that was divorced, even people that are divorced and now are in a good, strong marriage and have moved on with their life. I've always heard those people come up to me genuinely and say, Brother Jeff, you go in and preach like you preach. You say what needs to be said because I don't want people to go through the hell I've gone through. Uh, divorce is hell. Let me tell you what people say about divorce. Divorce is the closest thing you'll ever get to death. And I've gone, to, I've gone to the courts with people that are getting divorces. I've gone there before, been in those places. I'll never forget. Uh, 
to rest. This would be a great, great, uh, probably a great study for Dark Horse Press. The idea of standing there at a circuit court or standing at a place where you've got, you've got the wife, you've got the mother with over on this side, you've got the husband, the father on this side, the children running back and forth between them. Mom's got some of extended family with her and friends. Dad's got some extended family and friends. And, you, and hey, it's not just one couple, it's couple after couple after couple after couple lined up down the hallways waking, waiting to go to court, stand before a judge. There's nothing Nothing pretty about it. So let me tell you, let me tell you, when I do a marriage ceremony and it doesn't work out, it affects me so deeply that I want to leave the ministry. That's how painful it is for me. Last week, uh, I got tickled. I think it was last week, Eric and Sarah came up to me and said, uh, Brother Jeff, 16 years ago, what, you just celebrate your, yeah. He said, 16, was 16 years? said, 16 years ago, you know what you were doing this past Friday. They said, you were marrying us. And uh, I knew Sarah back in night when she was a teenager. I've watched her graduate out of high school, watched her graduate out of college, watched her get married, watched her and been a part of them as a, the two girls were brought into their life, Caroline and Brendan. And I've seen this family grow, and they're still a part of us, plugged into this church. But she said, do you know where you were uh, 16 years ago? She said, you know, her and Eric were smiling, saying you were marrying us. I said, I don't remember that, but I remember the rehearsal supper. Because that's where I met Marge and Jerry, and, they, and they, that's the only rehearsal supper that they served ribeye steak. And I've never forgotten that rehearsal supper. And the only thing I can say to Eric and, and, Eric and Bethany is that it would really be nice if we had ribeye steaks for the rehearsal meal. You know, that's what I like. I like to be a part of, of marriages that work. But I've been counseling about 40 years. I haven't earned a doctorate. I've done a lot of counseling. I do a lot of counseling with, uh, with a corporation where I'm a chaplain. I do a lot of counseling. I've done it in the military. My high, I got the highest ratings, A-plus ratings, and a battalion chaplain in the area of counseling. I, I love helping people. If there's any way I can help people fix a relationship, fix a marriage, I love to do that, but it doesn't always work because we're sinful. And sometimes, no matter how hard we try, people look and say, Brother Jeff, it takes two people to make it work, and they don't want it to work. So in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul is talking to the church at Corinth. Now, the church at Corinth has sent a delegation to Ephesus, and basically they've come and they've asked a lot of questions. But one of the big questions is this idea of marriage. About He talks about virgins, talks about widows, talks about married. Then he talks about a category called unmarried. And, and, and they come with a lot of questions. So again, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, beginning at verse 1 now, for the matters you wrote about, it's good for a man not to marry. But since there's so much immorality, each man should have his own wife, each woman her own husband. The husband should fulfill his marital duties to his wife, and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife's body does not belong to her alone, but also to her husband in the same way. The husband's body does not belong to him alone, but also to his wife. Do not deprive each other except by mutual consent and for a time so that you may devote yourself to prayer, then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. And quickly, last week we said this. Paul was just simply saying, he said, listen, if there's a way, and he'll go on to say this, if you can remain single and God's giving you the ability physically, biologically to do that, you can live without that sexual fulfillment that comes in marriage. God, if God's given you the gift, Paul said, listen, that's great, you're better off. And then Paul says, but let me tell you about celibacy. Celibacy is not for marriage. There's a responsibility between a man and a woman to fulfill their marital responsibility of fulfilling each other physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and also that part of just sexual contentment. It's the number one need of 80,000 men polled. Ladies, the number one need was sexual fulfillment. It wasn't sex, it was sexual fulfillment. So Paul makes it very clear here. And now in verse 6, he said, I say this as a concession, not as a command. I wish that all men were as I am. Paul said, I'm single. I wish you were all like me. But each man has his own gift from God. One has this gift, another has that. Now to the unmarried and the widows, I say it is good for them 
to stay unmarried as I am. But Paul is really pushing the single life. But if they cannot control themselves, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. Let's stop there and pray again. Lord, we thank you. We love you. Pray, dear Lord, you'll use this time to speak to our hearts. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. I want to be sensitive to time. I know this is the 4th of July, the, the weekend, but let me let me take just a moment and, and, and just simply to say that we looked at some things last week. I don't want to go back and, and review that, so let me just encourage you to go back and listen to that on the website, and you can follow up with that. But Corinth, Corinth, the city of Corinth where this church was, was in a mess. A lot of the mess of Corinth centered around, um, uh, centered around the worship of the temple of Aphrodite, a thousand temple prostitutes, prostitution, sex was just big business in the city of Corinth. And, and so there were a lot of issues that surrounded what these people were coming to Paul and they were talking about. They were asking some real questions, basically saying this, what are we to do now that we've become Christians and we've converted to Christ? Now, I'm, I'm trying to figure out because I'm almost tempted. In fact, I'm going to do it. Let me give you a little bit of the scenario of Corinth. Okay, so stay with me here. Over 50% of the Roman Empire were slaves. Okay, let me let that sink in for a minute. In other words, over 50% of the citizens of the Roman Empire, they were slaves. Slaves that were owned by a master. Is everybody with me? So a lot of the people during the Roman Empire and a lot of the people that were making up the church at Corinth, these people were slaves. Now let me explain in Roman society the idea of marriage. Now I want you to hear me here because a lot of times what people do, people start making judgments based on their cultural context. In other words, they interpret the Scripture not from the cultural context of the Scripture. They inter interpret it from their own cultural context. Let me give you an example. This is fascinating. Stay with me. When we were on our way to Zimbabwe, we were dealing in Africa, we were dealing with the issue of polygamy. Does everybody know what I'm talking about? Polygamy is a man who has uh, Mormons sometimes will practice polygamy. You'll see a man married to a half dozen women. And a lot of people would even take the scripture and try to defend the, the practice of polygamy. So what they were trying to prepare us missionaries for was they were saying that when you get into the culture, the African culture, understand you're going to run into this. Now everybody listen closely. What's going to happen is, let's say a man, he's going to believe what you've said, he's going to come to Christ, yet he's going to have two or three wives. Now how are you going to handle that situation? So my thought was, as a missionary getting ready to go overseas, I thought, well, wait a minute. How do you, how do you justify polygamy anyway? Everybody look this way. Kids are fine. Look this way. Because you don't need to misquote me, and you need to know this, or you're going you're gonna to blow it on Facebook. That's where I worry about you, quoting me on social media. So look this way. So I'm sitting here trying to understand, reconcile, what do you do with polygamy? What do you do in that situation? So my thought was, how do, why, how do the African cultures justify polygamy? What's their thoughts? Listen to the answer. This is what they said. They said polygamy is our welfare system. You have to understand, we know in our culture, we know that boys are not as likely to survive prenatal, postnatal. We know that babies that are boys have more difficulty surviving than girls do. Girls just seem to do better. So you've got that biological issue. Another thing, warring. Uh, another thing, uh, a lot of the dynamics of the African culture, men die more quickly than women. I almost wanted to title this sermon A Case for Polygamy just so it would get a lot of views. Now this is what the African is saying to me. You don't understand. Boys don't survive like girls do in a, in a third world country. Uh, men die quicker than women do. 
So we've got a lot of these women, and they don't have husbands, so, uh, so they, and they've got the responsibility of children. So a lot of times, that's our welfare system. We take in and, and, and marry more than one individual so that we're able to... Now, I'm not making a case for polygamy. What I'm telling you is this was the cultural context that I needed to go into Africa and understand. I couldn't go in with my American Western evangelical views without understanding where these people were coming from because for a lot of these people, some of these men, they thought it was a great sacrifice to take in another family and provide for them. So Paul is dealing with a cultural context that in many ways is very different. Let me give you a few of them. There are four. And, and John MacArthur does an, a tremendous job in his commentary on 1 Corinthians. Because the vast majority of the people were slaves, if a man or a woman slave wanted to be married, what the slave owner did was he allowed them to live together in what was called a contubernium relationship. That meant tent relationship. In other words, live-in relationships were a way of life in Corinth and in that culture and in the Roman culture. So what two slaves would do, they would say, we're going to live in the same tent. We're going to consummate this relationship. And as long as their owner agreed to it, they were allowed to do it. So that's one group that's writing to the Apostle Paul saying what we do. In fact, listen to what MacArthur said. He said the arrangement lasted, listen to this, because we think that slavery only came about in this country. It's been around for forever and it's still going on now. It's amazing to me that we don't have much concern for the slavery that's going on all over the rest of the world, isn't it? Listen to what MacArthur said. He said about this contubernium relationship, he said this tent relationship, he said the arrangement lasted only as long as the owner allowed. He was perfectly free to separate them at any point and even to arrange them with another partner or to sell them to somebody else. Okay, so you get the drift here? You see the cultural context that Paul's dealing with? You see what Paul's dealing with here? Because some of these people were saying, listen, I've been in several contubernium relationships. I've been in several tent relationships and there could be a multiplicity of children and I've I've, I've, I, what do I do because I'm a Christian now? And I'm in this tent relationship. So MacArthur says many of the early Christians were slaves and some of them had lived, perhaps were still living in this sort of marital relationship. In other words, the relationship they were in was not a traditional wedding like Eric and Sarah had coming down the aisle in tuxedos and in wedding dresses and having a big... It wasn't anything like that. And let me tell you where that came from. That came from the Roman Empire, came through the Roman Catholic Church for all those people that seemed to take great, put great stock in that. So these people. Secondly, there was what was called the usus. Now listen to this. It was a form of a common law marriage. I asked Ledge last week, because it used to be this. If two people lived together for seven years, they were considered legally to be married with all the rights and the privileges and the legal, re the re legal responsibilities that come to a marriage as if they had been married by the law itself a common law marriage. I asked Ledge, is that still in Mississippi? And you said no, right? It's no longer, so don't be doing that. But in this time, in the time of Corinth, it was a form of common law marriage that recognized that, listen to this, that if a man and a woman lived, let's say in the tent relationship for one year, they were considered to be in a usus, U-S-U-S, -US, uh, a usus relationship by which they were considered now to be husband and wife. But remember, the owner could come along and say, nah, we're going to dissolve that, put you over here. I like this guy over here, and, and, and we're going to put you over here with this woman. The third relationship and the third marital status was this. When a dad, and, and this word is so long, I don't even want to get into it. But in the African culture of the Shona, we call it labola. In other words, let's put it this way. Uh, Bethany, and I don't want to make her cry, but Bethany has and had a tremendous dad. In fact, a while back, her dad had a massive stroke and 
lived for years with results of that stroke and finally went to be with the Lord, a godly, godly man. I One time I said, Bethany, I want you to see this. And it was just a list of, of all of the text messages that he had sent me because he listened live stream. He listened to our podcast and he would always, and periodically he'd call me, but he had such difficulty verbalizing that it was better for him sometimes to try to text me. And I handed her this and I said, you need to have this. You need to keep this. But let me tell you, if he were alive today and he were in his hell, he, if he were following the system that I'm talking about now, Eric would have to, he would have to put up some money for Bethany. I mean, we're talking about mechanical care for the vehicles for the rest of your life. In the African culture, a son-in-law in the Shona culture was Mukwasha. That's the Shona word. Matt and I, when we first went to Zimbabwe, me and Matt, my son-in-law, who's married to my oldest daughter, Amy, who's a dentist, and they have eight children. So when Matt and I were going to Zimbabwe, I said, now, Matt, I'm telling him in the airports, I'm telling him when we're flying on the plane, I said, now, Matt, listen, you're going to hear this word a lot, mukwasha. He said, what? I said, mukwasha. Well, what is that, mukwasha? I said, Mukwasha, when you hear the word Mukwasha, they're going to laugh. I said, every time, I said, Matt, I would bet my life they're going to laugh every time that word comes up. Mukwasha. And finally, he said, well, what does it mean? I said, it means son-in-law. Now, see, most of you don't have son-in-law, so you don't have no idea what I'm talking about. You'll find out. Russell's It'll be the closest you ever come to killing a man. <laughs> as protective as you are. But when, I, when we got to Zimbabwe, the Shona people were asking this. They wanted to know how much Matt had paid for Amy. And uh, I bled that for everything I could get. I said, uh, Amy, Vare Lunodura. Matt Mungasi Kisaho here. I said, Amy's very expensive, and he tried to talk me down. And they looked at me and they said, Wait a minute, she's a cherimba, which means she's a doctor? I said, Yes. She's worth at least 10 cows. I said, I didn't even get one heifer. <laughs> and uh, the reality is, is that when a dad got low, in this culture during the time of 1 Corinthians, when a dad got low on money, he simply sold his daughter. It was, an, it was just simply a business transaction where she was picked up, she was sold, given to a man, and that was just one more. And then we have the last one. The fourth type was what the more affluent, the nobility did. Listen to this. The affluent, the nobility, those with the money, they were married in a ceremony much like our modern marriage ceremony. It was adopted by the Roman Catholic Church. Let me tell you, the ceremony where the, the groom and the groomsmen come out here and the bride comes down the aisle and the bridesmaids are over here and the bride's family are here, groom's family are here, and this whole ceremony that we think is biblical, hey, listen, the Hebrew people don't have no idea what we're even talking about. This was Roman Empire. This was how the Romans married and it was incorporated, pulled into the Roman Catholic Church. But listen, it was adopted by the Roman Catholic Church. It was used with certain Christian modifications coming with little change into the Protestant faith through the Reformation. Look at this right here. You know what that is? What is it? Wait a minute, what does it say? I don't know if I can get it off. Uh, it's bent on top of that. But uh, maybe the cheap ring you got. No, I'm teasing. But anyway, uh, it's my wedding ring. Now, this what this does is this says that I'm taken. I belong to somebody. Sheila's sitting there going, you're right. And uh, this is something that came out of the Roman Empire, out of the affluent. You know what the Romans did when they did their cutting up cadavers? They discovered something. They discovered, you wonder why your ring's right here? They discovered that a nerve runs from this finger all the way to your 
So not even that's biblical. So the reality is, is that this is the context of which the Apostle Paul was trying to answer the question of what do we do? People were going, listen, I've been in this tent relationship, that tent relationship, I've been in, I, 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 you know, I was, I was sold by my dad to this person and, and then my slave owner broke that up or whatever. You, you know, there, were, there was a cultural context of all kinds of things. And Paul, you know what Paul was saying? Paul was saying, listen, let me just say this. Listen to this. Wherever you are, stay there. Whatever you're in. Just stay where you are right now and people were going wait a minute Paul is it that easy because a lot of times what happens when we become a Christian we want to try, try to sort everything out and fix everything we, we start working like that and Paul says first of all Paul says listen I understand the cultural context and the dynamics of what relationships you're in and I'm just telling you to stop for a minute take a long hard breath and wait on God let God fix it. Put it on the table, pray, and let God fix it. But Paul goes on to do this, and, I, and I've got to close because undoubtedly, and let me say this, and, and I'll close in a moment. There seems to be the belief right now, and I'm not, I'm not sure where it's come from. I don't believe some of the people that are promoting this, they didn't come up with this themselves. They're listening to something, and I know that for a fact. But the implication is, is to some people that, uh, that Matthew 19, where Jesus talks about marriage and adultery, and remember this, we looked at that last week. You can go back and listen to that on our podcast. They seem to say this, that if you've been married and you're divorced and you're remarried, you're in adultery, you're living in adultery, and you'll go to hell when you die. And some would interpret Matthew 19 and what Jesus said as kind of the eternal state, the permanent position that you are an adulterer, you're going to be an adulterer, and you're going to go to hell when you die. Uh, I, I, I wrote this down. Paul in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11, I don't have time, but let me, let me well, let's look at it. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Let's look at it real quickly. Watch what Paul says here. Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor the drunkard, nor the slanderer. The slanderer, isn't that interesting? How many people gossip? Diabolos, slanderer. Slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Now watch, look at the next words. And that is what some of you were. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Paul said you were that. Let me ask you something. Does David ever quit being an adulterer? Really? I mean, if you look up genealogy, his wife Bathsheba is referred to as the wife of Uriah the Hittite, even in genealogy. You know what that says? Is David was an adulterer. David committed adultery with Bathsheba. But if I were to ask you, you say, well, wait a minute, do you believe that David is in heaven? And the answer to that would be yes. What is Paul saying here? Paul was saying, listen, your identity, my identity was this. We were sexually immoral. We were idolaters, adulterers, effeminate, homosexual, thieves, greedy, drunkards, slanderers. Paul goes on and on. He says all of this. He says, but such were some of you. Well, when did you quit being that? When you positionally became, when you positionally were put in Christ. Once you're positionally in Christ, your identity is no longer your past. Your identity is no longer your failures. Your identity is no longer your sin. Your identity is in Christ. Positionally, you are in Christ. His righteousness has been imputed to your account. Your sin, past, present, future, sum total, all sin, has been imputed on the cross of Christ. He's paid your penalty positionally now you're in Christ. Paul said it this way. He said you're a new creation. All things have passed away and behold all things have become new. 
So I don't know where this idea is coming from, but I can tell you this much. It's not coming out of the Bible. And I, in fact, I'd venture to say that it's coming out of Africa. And I have good reason to say that. So uh, let's stop right here and close, and it may be a little bit scattered, but what I'm saying to you and I is simply this, that the Apostle Paul is dealing with what appears to be an impossible situation. Let me say this before I close, because I think this is important. He go, And I, I think what I'll do next week, no notes, I'll come up here and just exegete verse by verse. We'll move through it real quickly. But I want, to, I want you to understand this. I want you to hear me because I think this is where people mess up. Paul talks about four groups of people. He doesn't talk about the four of the Roman Empire is talking about. Live in relationships, labodal, labo, uh, labola, bride price, fathers. He's not talking about any of that. Paul's talking about four individuals. Everybody stay with me and I'll pray. Give me, give me two minutes of your undivided attention. He talks about the married. He said, stay married. If you become a Christian and you're married, stay married. In other words, Paul said, don't go out there and just because you're your unbelieving husband or unbelieving wife, uh, the, the, you're married, stay married. Stay with them because the reality is, is that you may be the influence they need to change their life. So Paul said, stay married. To the widow, he says, listen, you're better off. You've been married. But if you can remain a widow, Paul said, you're better off to do that. In fact, Paul said in, to Timothy, he said, look, after 60, better off not to marry. So uh, he said, widows, if you can, if you can do it, stay married. Young widows, probably not. Older widows, try it. Try everything you can today. Stay that way. Then Paul talks about the virgin. And what Paul's saying is for those that have, that have never had sexual relations, for those that are virgins, though, he, Paul is saying, listen, if you can stay single, you need to do that. But if you can't, if you burn with passion, if you're single and you can't handle that, and you're not gifted that way, then you need to aggressively begin to look for somebody to share your life with. Then Paul brings up this fourth group called the unmarried. Now let me tell you, your translations are wrong. And this is where people mess up here. They see when Paul talks to the widow and then they look and see the unmarried and they see the Greek word for unmarried down there in the bottom being sub, a little note down there that says the widower. That's not a correct translation. Paul's not saying virgin, widow, married. Uh, but Paul's not saying married, widow, widower, and virgin. That's not what Paul's saying. Unmarried is not translated widower. It's not just because it's in a male tense, it does, a masculine tense, it doesn't mean that because Paul will use that word that some people translate wid widower later on to, uh, he uses it with feminine, with women. Am I making sense? Some are shaking their head, the rest is back there going, no. Let me explain it again. Paul's dealing with four groups of people. He's dealing with those people that are married. He said, if you can't stay married, but if you're abandoned, if they walk out, if they leave you because of your faith, let them go. Paul said that. He then deals with the widow. He said, if you're a widow and your, your spouse has died and you can remain a widow, then you need to stay that way because you'll be better able to serve the kingdom of God. You'll be more like me, Paul said. Then Paul said, and if you're a virgin, which means you're not married, you've never been married, and, uh, but you can't control your passion, and you, it, 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 then Paul said, if you haven't been given the gift of celibacy, celibacy then, the, then, the, then the virgin you need to marry. You need to start looking and find you a spouse. But then he has a, well, he has a group called the unmarried. They're not virgin, they're not widowed, they're not married. They're unmarried. What is that group? What that group is is all those people I've been talking about. What that group is, is those people that are divorced, those people that their marriages fell apart, those people that their lives fell apart. They're, 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 those are the people that are divorced, relationships have failed, and Paul's saying to those people, unmarried. And what I'm saying is that some people translate that as widower, and that's not the correct Greek translation there. He's saying to that group out there, 
that are in failed relationships and they're picking up the pieces and it's over and it's done and now they want to move on with their life and there's a possibility of finally finding happiness. Paul said, listen, better to marry than to burn. Better to marry than to spend your life spending it struggling in sexual sexual appetites that can never be fulfilled, never be taken care of. You want the physical intimacy and the relationship and you don't have it. Paul said, listen, those people need to marry. So I don't know where you are right now, but I want you to know that you have a God that loves you unconditionally. And you may be here today and you may say, you know, I've, I, I've been beat up in relationships. I've been taken advantage of. I've been hurt. Uh, people have used me and abused me. I want to close with this story and then we'll pray. Alexander the Great, a conqueror, was going through a campaign that conquered the world. He came to this village and he told his soldiers, he said, kill every man, woman, boy, and girl. Kill every human being. So people were running everywhere. Well, here's Alexander the Great, this great general. He's on his horse. He's up on his horse. His sword is drawn. And, and Alexander looks down at this man, and this man is standing there with his wife. He's just a peasant. And this man drops to his knees and he, at, the, at the horse and at this rider, Alexander the Great. And he begins to plead. He said, I don't care what you do. You can kill me, but spare her. Let her live. And he's crying and weeping, and he's just clinging, and he's begging the general, Alexander the Great. He's saying, please, just spare her. Just spare my wife. Please. And finally, Alexander, I mean, at that moment, is ready to kill both of them. And then he looks and he says, to those that are about to take their heads off, he said, let them go free. And so these peasant man and woman are walking away. And as they walk away, she, she's looking at him. And he looks at her and he said, did, did you see that? She said, yes. He said, did you see that? She said, yes. He said, did you? He looked and said, did you see Alexander the Great? This world conqueror, this military leader, did you see him? And all of a sudden she cries and she looks and she takes his face. She said, I wasn't looking at Alexander the Great. I was looking at the man who was pleading for my life. No matter where you are, what you're going through, You've got a loving Savior who stands at the right hand of the Father and loves you with an abandonment. You can trust Him. Let's stand and pray. Our Heavenly Father, we just thank You, Lord, that You love us. Lord, it's been a little scattered this morning. But Lord, in somehow, some way, I pray that people understand that sometimes when we look at the Bible, that the Bible, Jesus was speaking to a Jewish audience. Paul would be speaking to the Gentiles. And sometimes Paul, will look at this next week, Paul would say Jesus said this, but he didn't say this because he never addressed this. We'll look at the authority of Scripture and how we're to interpret it. But Lord, I pray today that for every man and woman and sound of my voice, I pray for young people. I pray for young singles, old singles, people that are struggling right now, living life alone, that God, if it should be your will to bring somebody into their life that they can share their life with, for some of these young people, that God, you will bring into their life exactly the person you want them to have, that they will be patient, that they'll wait. Maybe it's to get an education. Maybe it's to get a vocational training. Maybe it's to position themselves in a place that, God, they can be fully invested into the kingdom and trust you that somewhere along the way that you'll bring the right person. 
And may they understand the words of Oswald Chambers when he said, when in doubt, don't. May they be willing to wait on you. And Lord, if they're living in promiscuity right now, they're living in sexual promiscuity, may they stop it right now. May they end that. May they make the decision from this day on, I'm going to be a virgin. And Lord, I'm not just talking to girls, I'm talking to boys, talking to young men. I pray, dear Lord, that um, you would protect our young singles today. I pray for those that may be older that have been beaten up in relationships, for those that may be widowers and widows, and for those that may be, dear Lord, senior adults, that, Lord, they're still asking, struggling with being alone, saying, God, is there any hope for me? May they, first of all, realize that, Jesus, you are the pride, the groom, Lord, if it should be your will, you can bring somebody into their life. I pray, dear Lord, for those that have been beat up in a marriage and ended in divorce. Somehow, dear God, you've brought healing to their life and they now have finally seen and in their life an individual that they know, God, you divinely ordained and brought into their life. And Lord, you're bringing healing now and you're restoring what the Bible said the locusts have eaten. You're the God that fixes things. Sometimes you're the God that makes things new. I pray, dear Lord, whatever situation people may be in today, that they find their fulfillment, their joy, their happiness, their satisfaction in a relationship with Jesus first. Because except the Lord builds a house, they labor in vain to build it. So, Lord, I pray, dear Lord, and I pray if there's somebody here that doesn't know you, that the day that they would be saved, give their heart, give their life to you. And Lord, we'll give you the glory in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You come.